Welcome to this week's edition of the History Department Summer Teach-In on issues surrounding the uh, death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Stephen Judd, the Middle East historian in the department. And I noticed after the protests had erupted that a number of people were asking whether or not uh, the Black Lives Matter protests were the beginning of something like an American version of the Arab Spring. And so today I'm going to look at parallels and dis differences between uh, the two movements and draw some conclusions about that. Um, this is something I do with some trepidation because of course it is always hazardous to make comparisons of social movements across broad, broadly different uh, cultures and histories. Uh, the situations in the Middle East surrounding the Arab Spring were, of course, in a different cultural context with different kinds of regimes, with different kinds of grievances, and a different level of regime resilience uh, than we have here, or than we sometimes hope we have here, at least. Um, that said, it is, of course, uh, important to draw parallels and to think about how history moves in similar ways in different settings. Um, it's also important to recognize that the mere fact that we're asking whether this is something like the Arab Spring is significant, um, because, of course, the Arab Spring was not about changing specific policies about specific problems, but very quickly became about regime change. And the fact that people are asking these kinds of questions in America um, leads us to sort of have to ask just how resilient our actual uh, government institutions and regimes are. And that's, of course, something that's uh, startling to think about in many ways. Um, with these caveats, I will move on to talk about the actual beginnings of the two movements, which share some similarities, and the government responses to the movements, which also share some similarities, and then some differences and similarities that may suggest uh, where all of this is going and give us some sort of context to think about uh, larger questions. The Arab Spring began uh, in Tunisia in uh, December of 2010 in an incident that in many ways should not have erupted the way it did. Um, this was a protest against police brutality and corruption. Uh, what happened is in a small provincial town about uh, 200 miles from the capital, a uh, place called Sidi Buzid, an uh, agricultural community, uh, kind of middle class community, a um, man named Muhammad Bouazizi uh, was harassed by the police. He was a vegetable and fruit vendor. Uh, he was harassed by the police in the street, hit up for a bribe, refused to give the bribe, was then imposed a fine um, of the equivalent of about $3, which seems like very little, but in the context of his economy is um, a medium-sized fine. Um, rather than simply paying the fine, he went to the government center and protested and uh, complained about this and then proceeded to go outside and pour gasoline over himself and burn himself to death. Um, this sparked off protests and riots that led to the Arab Spring in Tunisia. Um, it's also not the kind of event that one expects to lead to these kinds of things. Protesting a $3 fine uh, is how the Arab Spring actually started. Um, if we move on to other places, we find a similar theme in that police brutality and corruption keep reappearing as the causes for these various uprisings. Uh, if we go to Egypt, which is of course the epicenter of the Arab Spring, uh, we have a similar situation. Uh, here, the incident actually occurred earlier in June of 2010 in Alexandria, uh, an important city, but not the capital, um, in a sort of middle-class part of the city. A man named Khaled Said uh, was dragged out of a cyber cafe and beaten to death by police. Uh, the story is that he had refused to give them a bribe. They had tried to plant drugs on him. They dragged him out and beat him to death. Uh, portions of this were caught on video and in photos and promptly began to circulate around on the internet and sort of boil around in various uh, internet uh, chat rooms. And eventually on Facebook, there was a, a group that was referred to as We Are All Khalid Saeed, uh, where people would also write about their own experiences with police brutality. Um, this became the focal point for the people moving into Tahrir Square 
and starting the demonstrations uh, in January, some six months later. Um, so we have here again an incident of police brutality in a provincial city that leads to people in the streets in the capital uh, and major, major protest movements. Now, in Syria, you also have a similar sort of dynamic. Um, in March of 2011, a group of teenage boys in the city of Dara in southern Syria um, spray painted graffiti on a building. Um, Dara is an agricultural city, a kind of loyalist area uh, to the Assad regime. Uh, the teenagers involved were from um, not top ranking families, but reputable and important families in the community. And one of the teenagers, uh, a 13 year old named Hamza al Khatib, uh, was killed in the process of being tortured by the police. This led to uprisings that almost immediately spread to the capital. And so here again, we have a situation where police brutality in a relatively small place occurs and leads to something much larger. Um, in the other countries where the Arab Spring occurred, these sorts of incidents were not as central. Uh, we do have protests in Jordan, um, but not over a specific incident, it's sort of a spillover from what's going on in other places. Uh, in Yemen, the protests, of Arab Spring style protests sort of morphed into the existing low level civil war there. Uh, Libya is an example of people uh, taking inspiration from the fact that regimes had fallen in Tunisia and in Egypt next door on either side of Libya uh, to take to the streets. Um, here the dynamic was much different um, because Libyan politics is much different from anywhere else. And also in Libya, we see early evidence of a lot of foreign involvement uh, and outside intervention in various ways, which is something we'll come back to. So what we see here is a sort of common thread in that most of the Arab Spring uprisings or riots or demonstrations or whatever we want to call them began as a result of police brutality, police corruption in out of the way provincial cities where one would not expect this to happen. In a normal functioning polity, this would have been local. This would have been you know, the local police commissioner and the local mayor and the local governor um, sorting this out and dealing with how to prevent this from happening again. Um, but in all of these cases, a small localized incident blew up into something much bigger, which of course suggests that there's a lot sort of seething under the surface uh, that is coming out um, that people were uh, largely ignoring or not aware of. And quite frankly, for those of us who study the Middle East, uh, much of this caught us entirely off guard. Um, we knew there was police corruption. We knew there was brutality. We knew there was torture in prisons and in police stations in all of these countries. Um, we didn't know that it had reached a bubbling point where a small incident would set off these kinds of things. Um, so we take this sort of context and now we come to Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, of course, we have in, with George Floyd, an incident of police brutality, incident of police murdering a suspect or an arrestee, I'm not even willing to call him a suspect necessarily. It is caught on tape and we have demonstrations and riots. Um, despite all that has happened since, in many ways, it may sound a bit sort of cold and callous about it, this is very much a small local incident. The police acted inappropriately, broke the law, killed someone in their custody, local police force, not federal police force. The local officials jumped in and tried to fire the police officers, arrest them shortly after when the demonstrations begin. Why does this local event then become something that is national? This is not as if this is the first time we have seen police in local cities engage in behavior that is, uh, to say the least, atrocious. Um, why does it blow up this time? 
And that's the interesting question to think about, because in many ways, that's where the parallel is to what's going on in the Middle East. You have these incidents all the time. Why this one? Why now did this blow up? Um, and it's also happening in places where things seem pretty peaceful and calm. A place like Dara, a place like um, Sidi Bouzid, these are not troubled cities. Minneapolis, these are not hotbeds of unrest. They're pretty stable, calm places. And so what's happening that an incident first occurs in those places and secondly blows up in the way that it did? Again, this indicates that there are much bigger grievances behind this than a single incident of police brutality. Now, so we see these sorts of commonalities here where these smaller events become catalysts for uh, complaints for a protest against larger injustices. And of course, where does this go? Um, well, we turn then to how the government responds to these incidents. And the responses of the regime in many of these cases is pretty similar. Um, you have an initial complaint, you have some demonstrations in the streets, government tries to ignore it and treat it as a local problem for a little while. When the pro protests get bigger, you have some police crackdowns, then you get larger protests, Eventually, the leader of the country himself has to speak to it. And the speeches that were given by Mubarak, by Assad, by Bin Ali in Tunisia, all have very similar kinds of elements. Um, there is a slight nod to the complaints, vague promises of reforms, the demonization of the protesters and rioters as outlaws, troublemakers, terrorists, so on and so forth, um, an effort to blame outside agitators in some ways, foreign forces involved, um, and ultimately the threat of a far greater crackdown. Um, in Tunisia, uh, this happened. Uh, Zain al Abidin bin Ali, the uh, president of Tunisia, um, gave a speech, declares martial law, declares a state of emergency. Um, after the speech, when things don't calm down literally overnight, he hops on a plane and leaves the country. Um, and we have then uh, regime change there. And this happened very quickly in Tunisia. It was less than a month from the time of the incident um, of the man lighting himself on fire until the president has fled the country. So this is very quick. Um, in Egypt, we also see President Mubarak address Congress or address the parliament in a sort of formalistic kind of way. Um, same kind of thing, nod to the problems, blame the protesters for being troublemakers, blame outsiders, promise a severe crackdown uh, if this doesn't stop immediately. Um, in Syria, uh, Bashar al-Assad waited a very long time uh, to address things. Uh, he finally spoke to the parliament uh, in January of 2012. Uh, this is months after the unrest had started. And again, delivers the hardcore law and order message. Um, Libya is a bit of an exception, in part because Libya almost instantly collapsed into civil war. Um, heavily armed conflict in Libya as opposed to the situation uh, in Egypt in particular and in Tunisia especially where there's not a lot of armed sort of combat of any sort. Um, and Gaddafi sort of gave his speech, um, not in the formal setting of the parliament, uh, but from the wall of the citadel. And I believe when he gave his speech, he was actually grasping a sword and it was, um, shall we say, an unusual address. Um, but again, Libya is different. Um, Jordan, King gives a speech, promises reforms, reshuffles the cabinet, uh, people accept that and things calm down quickly. So you see this pattern of 
a sort of lip service to reform and some sort of threat to a crackdown. Um, and the, of course, uh, blame game of outsiders, troublemakers, terrorists, and so forth. Um, well, we come to the US and we've seen in the American case a sort of series of speeches. Um, the first of which, of course, was um, at the White House uh, when the president took his little field trip through uh, Lafayette Park. Um, this was not much of a nod to the complaints of the protesters and essentially a sort of law and order style speech that's then reinforced with a more blunt law and order style speech uh, on July 3rd and then again on July 4th. And of course, blaming the protesters, demonizing the protesters, claiming that they are somehow manipulated by outside forces even is part of this response. And so there is indeed a parallel there. And in all of these cases, the speech by the leader is a crucial point because the audience, the public, is eager, anxious to see what direction things are going to go. And when the leader comes and speaks, they are hoping for some sort of reform, some sort of de-escalation of, of conflict, some sort of way out of the confrontation that is coming. And in each instance, instead of that, they get the law and order speech and they get the crackdown. And once it becomes clear that the leader has made his choice about how to address these problems, then the unrest grows because the system isn't working. Um, and this is what happened in all of these places in the Middle East. Um, we'll come back to uh, what's happening in the United States uh, in a couple of minutes, um, but there is a kind of parallel here. The chance for reform is from the current administration is very slim. And so those who had hoped that the system would work, probably pretty disappointed um, right now because it's a combative relationship with the authorities rather than an effort to problem solve. Um, and again, this is another sort of parallel with what happened in the Middle East. Now, there are some other parallels here that we should, of course, point out. Uh, one, in all of these cases, in all of the Arab Spring countries in the Middle East, in the Black Lives Matter movement here, um, the protesters are young. They are organized by young people who do not have a tremendous amount of faith in the political system as it exists. Um, online tools are used to organize, to spread both sort of logistical information about protests, also to spread various propaganda um, and messaging around. Um, the youth are more effective at this than the regime um, in all of these cases. Um, and so you have sort of young people, technology, and a sort of generational element uh, to what's happening here as well. And that, of course, is similar uh, in the United States and in the uh, areas where the Arab Spring occurred. Now, some differences that are notable, and one I alluded to at the beginning, is that in the Arab Spring, almost from the very beginning, it was not about reforming the police. It was not about getting a new anti-corruption law. It was about regime change. And this was especially true uh, in Egypt, uh, in part because regime change had happened in Tunisia. And so the prospect for regime change is there. Uh, in Egypt, the protesters in Tahrir Square are not chanting about police violence. They are chanting about regime change. The people want the regime to fall. Get out, irhal, go away. That's not about the police. That's about the government. And so almost immediately, this is not a movement for reform, but rather a movement for regime change. That's something we haven't seen here. And that's an important distinction, I think. Um, if you go to the protests, if you look at the videos of the protests, um, all of the various Black Lives Matter 
Black Lives Matter uh, protests that have gone on, the vast majority of this is about the issue of discrimination, police violence, and all of these kinds of things. There are a few anti-Trump signs in the mix, but the impetus for the movement is still largely about the social change and the cultural change that needs to take place. Um, that could change, but it hasn't changed yet. And that's something important. And again, this points, I think, to questions of the resilience of the system um, and whether or not people still have faith in the ability to change society, to change culture uh, without actually resorting to tearing down the entire system. Um, so this is, this is an important element as well. Now, another thing to watch and to watch very carefully is a key factor in what happened in various places in the Middle East is how the security forces responded. Um, the people who have guns, police, military, how they respond makes a big difference. In Egypt and Tunisia, the army largely stood aside, did not intervene to save Mubarak or Ben Ali. Um, in Syria and Libya, the army stayed true to the, to the ruler, at least to some extent, and the massive firepower that a state military can bring to the table uh, was brought and you collapse into civil war. Um, here in the US, it's been kind of curious to watch because there's been a mixed reaction from law enforcement. You see in some cases, law enforcement joining the protesters. You see police chiefs firing officers who have misbehaved and condemning them publicly. In other cases, you see dialogue going on between police leaders and protesters. And in some cases, you see the police in riot gear with tear gas dispersing crowds in fairly brutal ways. Sometimes you see all of this in the same place at the same time. Um, what I think this illustrates is that the situation in the US is not yet at that point where anybody is really talking about or thinking about regime change. The police, the military haven't reached that point where they have to decide, are we going to defend the regime even though it's done X, Y, Z? Are we going to turn our guns against our own citizens? They haven't reached that point. And this is why we have you know, local police forces and local uh, police chiefs and even military leaders all sort of all over the board is that that you know, terrible choice hasn't had to be made yet. And again, this perhaps reflects a degree of faith in the resilience of our government system uh, to address these problems. Now, if it reaches a point where that faith starts to dissolve, then we may see a different kind of outcome uh, that will not be uh, nearly as uh, calm as what we've seen thus far. Now, another element to keep in mind, in both Egypt and Tunisia, things went very quickly, a couple of months, and you have uh, Mubarak resigning, uh, you know, a month, you have uh, Ben Ali resigning, so this all moved relatively quickly, but the demonstrations were constant and sustained and growing. Tahrir Square was occupied constantly. The center of the capital was shut down every day, all day, for a long period of time. Um, that kind of sustained, constant presence is something that we haven't seen here. We see large demonstrations. We see marches. We see the same march occurring two or three different times. How many times have people met on the New Haven Green and marched to the police station? Um, but you don't see that sustained occupation kind of presence. Uh, perhaps you saw a bit of an attempt at that in Lafayette Park 
in DC, where of course the bizarre field trip to the church disrupted that. Uh, you saw a little bit of that in Seattle uh, with the Capitol Hill zone, um, but that's not the same as tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people at the Capitol refusing to go until something has happened. And so we don't have that kind of sustained churning effort here in the US. It's episodic still. Um, whether that is a product of our American attention spans or whether that is a product of people not wanting to be uh, in large groups of people for long periods of time uh, because of the pandemic is something I don't know. And in fact, the pandemic is also something for us to keep in mind. Um, when we ask why this incident, uh, is it connected to the underlying tension and anger and distrust that the pandemic and its response have brought? Is the pandemic contributing to Americans' unhappiness about police brutality and about the abuse of black citizens? Or is the pandemic keeping people home? Uh, I don't know that answer. I don't know that anybody knows that answer, but we can't ignore that intervening variable, um, certainly. Um, now, so we see here some parallels between what's happened. A relatively minor incident of police brutality blows up into protests. Leaders respond in almost the exact same way. Um, how it plays out is yet to be seen. And in the how it plays out part, we should also uh, be wary. Um, because of course, when you start talking about uh, the fall of the regime and about radical change, uh, sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. It doesn't always turn out so well. And here we have the benefit of nine years of hindsight in looking at what happened in the Middle East. Um, Nine years after the Arab Spring began uh, in a small town in Tunisia, uh, Tunisia is the only country that has made a significant positive transition uh, into a better, freer, less corrupt government. Um, in Egypt, you had a sort of brief interlude of euphoria after Mubarak resigned. Uh, then the religious parties took over after the election. Then the army came in. And now you have a younger, more competent, um, in many ways, more brutal version of Mubarak in uh, the new leader, Sisi. Um, in Libya, you're still in a country that's destroyed by civil war, now with outside forces intervening in all sorts of peculiar ways, a topic for another discussion. In Syria, the country is largely destroyed. Um, and so these efforts to bring change can bring change that is not pretty. Um, and that's something always to remember uh, when people start calling for tearing systems down is that you aren't assured of what the next system is going to look like or whether the destruction is going to be so total um, that there is no system. Um, so we also have to realize that systems of power political systems, armies, are not that easy to change or destroy or replace. Um, regimes have a tendency to rebuild themselves. People involved in the old regime have a tendency to come back somehow in the new regime. And the same problems kind of persist as the sort of destruction of systems and cultures uh, that create these sorts of circumstances is much more difficult than undoing a particular government. And I think that's something also to remember uh, when we look at things here in the United States. And perhaps this is where the Black Lives Matter movement has a bit of a better handle on things in that the structures and the systems that create our current um, oppressive, discriminatory, violent uh, police culture um, aren't going to go away with a new president or a new mayor 
or a new city council or a new chief of police. Um, these are much deeper kinds of issues that require more than just a change in personnel. Um, and I think that from what I see, the people in these movements, leading these movements, understand that this is systemic and not simply a matter of regime change, it's a matter of culture change. Um, and given that they understand that, it may proceed differently. Um, so when we look at the Arab Spring and the American Spring, um, we do see some parallels, we do see some differences. Um, and of course, um, as people hope for radical change in this country, uh, we also need to be careful that that radical change uh, does not follow uh, paths that produce something worse than what we have now. Um, but it is uh, interesting to look at these parallels and to think about them. And uh, I'm sure that we will be revisiting these questions at some point in the future.